Hi, this is Pastor Dan Kramer from Zion Christian Church in Pittsburgh. This program will give you a glimpse into the life of an amazing group of people who are seeing God do tremendous things. We trust that you're encouraged by our rich worship service and the ministry of God's Word. We'd love to have you visit with us here some Sunday morning at 10 o'clock. We'd love to make you welcome, and I know the Holy Spirit would encourage you. We take time in His presence to enjoy Him. Love to have you do that with us here at Zion Christian Church. Dear Father in heaven, we thank you this morning that we can gather together in the name of your Son. We just ask that Jesus Christ would be honored and glorified in everything that is, takes place in this room today. We just welcome the Holy Spirit we just step back and, and give our concerns to you and just say, God, be honored and be glorified. Let nothing keep me from honoring you the way that you deserve, Lord. And I thank you that you are God, you are in charge, you are worthy to be praised. And we just ask you, Lord, in the name of Jesus, to give us just a, a garment of praise. If anyone's come in here with the spirit of heaviness, that the oil of gladness would be upon our heads, Lord, this morning. Because you are here, and you are our God, and you are worthy, and we praise you, Lord. We give you glory, Lord. We give you the praise, and the glory, and the honor, because you are God. We just magnify your holy name, Lord God. So we thank you, Lord, for what you're going to do by your Holy Spirit in our lives today. In Jesus' name, and all God's people said, Amen. We're going to worship.
Bring me a soul set on fire for the Lord. How about you? That's it. That's my prayer today. God, set us on fire with your Holy Spirit. That, Lord, just bring back how we felt when we first accepted you, Lord, how, how we could not contain just the love that we felt. going every day when you think of an oil how it just makes things run smoother the holy spirit makes everything run smoother isn't that the truth everything everything give him praise and give him glory and honor can you worship the lord today can you give him praise give him glory and honor it's good to welcome the lord in this place let's sing these are the days of elijah declaring the word of the lord help me out dennis
what's his name? Who was and who is to come? What's his name? Jesus. Jesus. It's good to say that name, isn't it, Judy? Say the name of Jesus. Yes, it is, yeah. Because the, the demons shudder at the sound of that name. Amen. We call in the name of Jesus today. Who am I that the highest king would welcome me? Wow. Who he says I am. I am a child of God. Yes, I am. Yes, I am. Can you say I'm a child of God? Yes, I am. Yes, I am a child of God.
sharing some thoughts about uh, the church. And when the Lord returns, he's coming for a glorious church, is what the Bible says. Filled with glory, filled with his glory. And that is going to be something to behold. And when we think about the church, the church is what God forged as a tool or a weapon in the fires of redemption, as the primary means through which he will accomplish his purposes on the earth. There are other ways that he accomplishes too, but the primary means that God accomplishes his purposes on the earth is through his people. And Jesus said in Matthew 16, 18, now this isn't my opinion, although it is my opinion. It's my opinion because it's his word. Amen. But it, I didn't make this up. This did not originate with me. This originated with the head. And he says, I will build this church, I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not overpower it. Amen. He said that. He said that. How many of you know he knows what he's talking about? And that's where our confidence lies, is in the Lord Jesus as the head of his church, working and orchestrating things in the lives of his people. And I'm so thankful to be a part of his church. By definition, the church means literally the called out ones. The Greek word that is used in the Bible is ekklesia, and I know everyone's not sitting here going, oh, yeah, you know. <laughs> but it, it literally means those who have been called out. And you know what? I am so glad. When you look at society and the world we live in, I'm so thankful that he's called me out of that mess and into his purposes and into his kingdom. I'm so thankful that he's delivered me from the power of darkness and brought me into the kingdom of his dear son. So thankful. So we've been called out. Called out implies there's been a change that's taken place in our lives. Something radical has happened. You, you can't get plugged into 40,000 volts of electricity and something not happen, right? So, you know, it's, it's not that we're finished being changed because that's not going to happen this side of eternity. But we've been called out. And that's a beautiful thing. The church is the regular assembling of those who have been called out for the purpose of worship, ministry, teaching, and service. The regular assembling of those who have been called out. Acts chapter 2, verse 42 through 44. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe and many wonders and miraculous signs were done by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. A beautiful picture of how it was in the New Testament. So what is God's purpose in calling people out and calling people together to pursue his purposes? I think that one of the, the, the main reasons, it might be summed up like this, for the purpose of the church is for God's people to be equipped to live in and demonstrate authentic Christianity. And we have a, a definition here of authentic Christianity. Kind of long, but it says it. Coming under the loving lordship of Jesus and being joined to a community of imperfect people. Anyone perfect here? <laughs> Only in him, right? Only in him. Well... Actually, perfect does just mean mature, so hopefully we have some mature people. But we're not mature in every way, right? We're not mature in every way. Being joined to a community of imperfect people who are learning to live biblical lives and serve biblical purposes together in a new and biblical way. You really cannot read the New Testament without seeing the fundamental importance of local gatherings of believers learning to live together, imperfect people. 
Uh, how many of you know, uh, when, when God puts living stones together, some of those living stones are going to rub you the wrong way sometimes, right? I'm sure I've rubbed some of you the wrong way sometimes. <laughs> So, it, being joined to a community of imperfect people who are still learning. And aren't you glad that because we're still learning, we can extend grace to one another, Donna? <laughs> I'm kidding, too. <laughs> so, that's authentic Christianity. Uh, there really is not in the New Testament the idea that people are not part of church. That when people get saved, they become a part of a community. And in that community, they learn how to function and learn how to live biblical lives. Sometimes they learn by their mistakes. Sometimes they learn by other people's mistakes. Uh, sometimes they learn through uh, conversations and, and uh, you know, the, the overall ministry of the church that's taking place. And I like to think about what Jesus says and does. And, you know, the early church was so united. And if the church of Jesus is to recapture this incredible testimony on the earth that it once had, the kind of impact on society that the first church had when they turned the world upside down. I mean, can you imagine? Uh, wow, turning it upside down actually turned it right side up. Right? <laughs> Because it was already upside down. So, uh, you know, I don't, well, I'm not going to mess with what the Bible says. But there, there, you can also make a point that they turned it upside down, but in God's eyes, they turned it up, right side up. And if we're going to recapture that, it, it must again be characterized by a company of people who are of one heart and soul, especially in an all-consuming commitment to Jesus as Lord and in fulfilling our biblical responsibilities to further his kingdom, to care about one another. And these responsibilities have to be clearly understood for people to understand what it is that the Lord is asking and wanting. So we think about this church, and uh, there's a few things that the Bible says the church is. Now, this is not an exhaustive list. But the church is meant to be the pillar and the foundation of truth. 1 Timothy chapter 3, 14 and 15. Although I hope to come to you soon, I am writing you these instructions that if I am delayed, you may know how people ought to conduct themselves in God's household, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and the foundation of the truth. In our society, there's only one group that's holding up the truth from God's perspective, and that's his church. We are not the truth, but we're the pillar that he sets it on, that people can see what his will is and understand what this book teaches and says, how we're meant to live, how our marriages are meant to function, how our interactions are meant to be. The church is where God displays his truth. Far too often, the church has fallen short in that. But how many of you know we're still learning? We're still learning. We haven't arrived. We're still learning. But he wants to display his, church, his, his truth like setting a, a, a trophy up on top of a pillar. And the church is that pillar. We're meant to be solid and Rock solid because our lives are based on this book and what the Bible says. And he's given us proof that this is his inspired word. I don't want to take a long time with this because many of you are well familiar with this. But the 300 prophecies about Jesus Christ's first coming that were foretold before he was ever born is ample proof that this book is inspired by God because people are not capable of doing that. It's just simply not humanly possible. And that's God's sign and God's seal that you can believe what's written in, this, in the pages of this book. It's inspired by him. And when society is falling apart and, 
And, you know, it seems like uh, anything goes in this day and age. People just have that kind of idea that anything goes. It doesn't matter. You can do whatever you want. God wants to display his truth set upon his people. Anything does not go. It's a narrow path. But I want to tell you, that narrow path is filled with his presence. And that narrow path is filled with his glory. And that narrow path is the path that leads to life. And the wide path that many people traveled on is a path that actually leads to destruction. And God wants to display his truth upon the pillar and the foundation, which is the church. The church is the visible expression. It's meant to be as to how truth works and what it is. When people look at the church, they should be able to say, that's how forgiveness happens. <laughs> oh, ouch, right? You know, oh. How many of you know that even in the church, we sometimes find it hard to forgive? I find it hard to forgive. It takes me a while. I will get there. I promise you that. I will get there. But it's not always like that. And in a world that is just filled with hatred and division, and with, uh, you know, just all these things, people separating, all, uh, it's meant to be in the church that we see. So this is what the Bible says when it says we forgive. This is what it means when the Bible says that we're to live a holy life. You know, he, he displays his truth. He puts it upon the pillar of the church. And... Uh, I think it's interesting that on the day of Pentecost, one of the things that, that Peter preached was be saved from this evil generation. You know, he, they were calling people to faith in Christ, but he also said, reject the evil that's taking place in that generation. How many of you know if it was evil in that generation, <laughs> there's a lot more evil in our generation, I, I would think we would have to say. But aren't you glad that you're part of something that is meant to be the display that holds up the pillar and the, that we're part of the pillar and the foundation of truth? And we can't back down that, that Jesus Christ is Lord. Jesus Christ is the only way to the Father. There is salvation in no other. The, the provision that he has given us to, for eternal life can only be found in one place, and that's in Christ. It's the, we're the pillar that, that holds up the foundation of that truth. And people need to know that. So many times I have people say to me, well, there's only one God. And what they mean is it doesn't matter what God you serve because in their opinion, there's only one God and it doesn't matter. But, but I tell them, you know, you're absolutely right. There's only one God. But it, but it doesn't mean what you're thinking. <laughs> It doesn't mean that any God is okay. It, 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 there really is only one God. And we're to hold up the, that truth that Christ made that relationship with the Father possible. The pillar is also meant to be, or the church is also meant to be, people who are being built together for a place of his presence. Ephesians chapter 2 Verse 19, consequently, you are no longer foreigners and aliens, but fellow citizens with God's people, members of God's household, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ himself being the cornerstone. In him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. In him, you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. The, that, that's why worship is so important. Uh, we're living stones, and, and as we come into the presence of God, we're living stones being built into a spiritual temple. Inside a physical building, we are spiritually living stones. That, that, that God wants his glory and his presence so abundant when we meet together to worship Jesus. And when even two or three gather together in his name, his promise is there that he is in the midst. Isn't that wonderful? And that's why worship is so important. 
God inhabits the praises of his people. When we come before him with open hearts, it's like the Holy Spirit just descends in such a powerful way. So I want to tell you, we're, we're being built together. And, and how strong a word is that? You know, we're not a bunch of marbles that have been tossed on the floor and they just everywhere, you know. We're being built. There's purpose. Lives are being connected, and, and this one's here, and, and this rough edge has to be chopped off so it'll fit right in place. We're being fitted. We're being built together, and my rough edges are still being chopped off too. Into a place where God's glory dwells. And what a wonderful, wonderful thing. The church according to the book of Ephesians, is a display of the fullness of Christ upon the earth. I, I can't even wrap my mind around that, to be honest. But when we look at, at the life of Jesus and the person of Jesus, and the church is meant to be the fullness of that upon the earth. I mean, Christ was the, the apostle, and Christ was the prophet, and Christ was the evangelist. Christ was the shepherd. Christ was the teacher. Christ was the healer. Christ was the deliverer. Christ was the one that demons fled from. And the Bible says that the church is meant to be the fullness of that. Isn't that incredible? There are meant to be healings taking place. There is meant to be freedoms coming. There's meant to be all these things. I can't say that we've arrived, and that's probably why we're all still here, <laughs> because the church hasn't arrived at that yet. But do you know what? That's where he's taking this thing. I hope I get to see it in my lifetime. We, we get glimpses of it. You know, we see segments of it. But wow, when the whole Jesus is seen in the whole church... Man, how about that? That's our destiny. The church is those who are reconciled to God and each other by the cross. Ephesians chapter 2, 12 through 22. Remember that at that time you were separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel, foreign foreigners to the covenants of promise, without hope and without God in this world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far away have been brought near through the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made the two one and has destroyed the barrier, dividing the wall of hostility by abolishing in his flesh the law with its commandments and regulations. Isn't that powerful? Reconciled to God, reconciled to each other through the blood that Jesus shed. You know, we should never, ever allow ourselves to become too familiar with the reality that Christ shed his blood, that it loses its meaning. And I love the glimpse of heaven we get in the book of Revelation where, where there's a lamb standing bearing the marks of crucifixion and all heaven just goes wild. Because that's the reason that we're going to be there. It's not because we were holy enough or smart enough or, uh, you know, uh, made this choice or that. The reason we're going to be there is because Christ died upon the cross. Christ shed his blood for us. And we had the, the good sense to say yes. <laughs> My son-in-law likes to say uh, what kind of people are going to be in heaven? And you get a lot of answers to that. Holy people. Well, hopefully people are holy. People who have studied the Bible. Hope, yeah, we better have studied the Bible. People who haven't done too many wrong things. Yeah, the, the reality is the people who are going to be in heaven are people who have been forgiven. That's the reality. 
The people who are going to be in heaven are people who have been forgiven. And uh, yes, of course, we need to grow in holiness. And yes, of course. But you know what? That is not what makes it all possible. What makes it all possible is the blood that Jesus shed. And as he stands in heaven with the marks of his crucifixion, they're shouting, worthy is the lamb. Do you know there's only one thing in heaven that was made by people? And that's the scars still visible in the body of Jesus who willingly gave himself for our salvation. That's our Savior. And that's the point of our reconciliation. There is no one in this room who doesn't have to forgive people sometimes. It just There's no one because our world just isn't like that. But I know for myself, I will get there because I don't want that to stand between God and me that I have refused to forgive somebody. I don't want to be that person who has been forgiven 200,000 years uh, of, of the average man's wages and I refuse to forgive four months of the average man's wages that someone owes me. I'm not going to be that person. I will get there, I promise you, to forgive. And that's the parable that he told. One guy in the average year's wages owed 200,000 years to, to his master. Impossible. He was forgiven, and then he wouldn't forgive the guy who owed him four months' wages. Do you want to be that person? Not me. So reconciled to God and each other by the cross. When we see what God has done to forgive us, how can we withhold forgiveness for somebody else? The church is designed to give glory to God. Ephesians 3, 20 and 21. Now to him who is able to do immensely more than all we can ask or even imagine. And by the way, I can ask and imagine quite a lot. How about you? <laughs> But to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. You know, throughout all generations. Some people believe that as the end times progress, the church is going to get weaker and weaker and weaker. I don't happen to believe that. I believe that the darker the world gets, the more the church is going to shine. And uh, even though the Bible does say that in the last days there will be a great falling away, and there will be because the Bible says that, it also says that in the last days people will come streaming to the house of the Lord. You've got to look at both things. And I have no idea why I said that. <laughs> But it was good, <laughs> I think. <laughs> Designed to bring glory to God throughout all generations. To him be glory in the church. My dad was quite a character. A wonderful godly man, wonderful father. But we were in a church one time where the preacher was preaching this. In the last days, there will be no gifts of the Spirit. In the last days, the church is going to be so hard put and in so bad conditions. My dad, ah, baloney. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, dad. <laughs> A good comment. <laughs> the church is where we're prepared for active works of service. Ephesians 4, 11 and 12. It is he who gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some to be evangelists, some to be pastors and teachers, to prepare God's people for works of service so that the body of Christ might be built up. Yeah, I'm so blessed. I, I really don't know how it happened, but we, we just started counting the teams that we have in this congregation. And, and before the first note is, or actually as the first note is being sung in our worship service, there have been 
13 or 14 different teams who have been accomplishing things, working on things to make this possible. From Sunday school to opening up the building to worship to preparing food for afterwards to praying before the service begins to to you know turning on the PA to setting up the videos to I mean just so many things are taking place and I sit back and I think you know God how did that even happen I mean uh, we're meant to prepare people for the for the ministry of service and here it, in, in a wonderful way, it's really taking place. Isn't that tremendous? We, we have actually over 30 teams that, are, that function within this congregation. And there's three more on the horizon, at least. But there's 30 teams. And it, isn't that wonderful that somehow God, without us even realizing that he was doing it, has enabled us to prepare people for works of service. And people have volunteer hearts. They, they want to plug in. They want to do something. They want to, you know, they, they want to make a difference. And I realize there are times and seasons, and sometimes God sets us aside and brings us back in. And I'm not trying to put a guilt trip on anybody. But I am trying to say it is wonderful to think about 30 teams that function within the life of this small congregation. And that says a lot about you. It says a lot about your response to God. You, you want to give yourself to him. There's a few teams that are coming up, and uh, maybe another time we'll, we'll talk about that. But, you know, we, we think about this being prepared for works of service. Uh, a man came to me, and he's, uh, it was an Nepali man, and, and he said to me, uh, uh, Pastor Danny said, I'm a little concerned about my community. And I said, uh, well, what is your concern about your community? And he said, I'm concerned that so many people are becoming content with just buying a house and watching their children grow up. And I said to him, that is called the, the American dream. And he said, do you think that is a good thing? And I said, well, yeah, that is a good thing. I said, but... If that's all there is, they're missing something because we're meant to serve a purpose that is bigger than ourselves. We have to have a vision to accomplish something with our lives that is bigger than just what's in it for me. And the main thing we should be concerned about accomplishing is what this book teaches. Serving. Caring, loving, evangelizing. And that's one of our teams that we're going to work on for 2019 is an evangelism team who when someone does raise their hand and is going to be trained how to really make sure that they've come right through to Christ and put the, what's, in, what's needed in their hands to make sure that they get grounded in Christ. Keith Tusi talked about that to the pastors. All you said to all the pastors, how many of you pastors believe people are going to get saved in your church? And of course, every hand goes up. And he says, well, how many of you have a trained evangelism team to talk to those people and make sure they understand what they're doing? We're like, oops. <laughs> so 2019, that one's coming. There's a couple more that are coming too. But, you know, we're, we're meant to serve something that's bigger than us. Billy Graham said one time, a person who's all wrapped up in themselves makes a small package. And isn't that the truth? <laughs> you know, we're meant to be out and about. I was asked to come and speak about my life with the Nepali community at a college last week. And a different college is asking me this week to come and speak about my life with the Nepali community here in Pittsburgh. And they asked me this question. They said uh, it was a group of graduate students who were studying the Bhutanese refugee community in Pittsburgh. And they asked me, what is, the, what is the most significant thing that you have done? And I'm sitting there. I'm going through this checklist, you know. I mean, what haven't we done? 
you know, really, in all honesty. What happened? We have fed them. We have helped them with prescriptions, driven them to doctors, at ESL. I mean, just, we've just done so much. And so finally they come to me and they say, what is the, what is the most significant thing that you have done for the Nepali community? And the common denominator to all those other things was, I said to them, we have loved them. And they know that we have loved them. And because we have loved them, we've done all the other things that we have done. And, you know, that has to be the motive for, for why we do the things we do. Because we love people. Because God loves people. And learning to, uh, to, to mature into that. Being prepared for active works of service, designed to be held together as every member grows and functions. Your role is important. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 14, then we will be no longer infants, tossed back and forth by waves, blown here and there by every wind of teaching, by cunning and craftiness of men and their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow up in all things into him who is the head, even Christ. From him, the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love, even as each part does its work. You know, every part's contribution is significant. Everyone's contribution is important. And God has uniquely designed you to be you, and he's uniquely designed me to be me. I'm not like a lot of other preachers. When I'm not in this pulpit, I'm quiet. That's not really normal for a preacher. Uh, usually, you know, you don't think of a preacher being reserved. But, I, you know, I, when I'm not here, I'm actually a little bit reserved. And I've heard people say that, you know. Well, he's kind of quiet. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I am. Uh, that's the way I am. You know, it's the truth. But I'm designed for the function that I'm meant to have. And you, know, and you are designed for the function that you have, are meant to have. And as we, 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 everything is held together and grows as every member functions. And like we said last night, two people accepted the Lord here last Sunday. That was a result of all those teams and this team that sits in here functioning together, everyone doing their part. Isn't that right? Amen. If Hank hadn't figured out the boiler, we wouldn't have had heat last Sunday. And if we didn't have heat last Sunday, those two people probably wouldn't have been here and you might not have been either. You know, he did his part. And that's how it works, isn't it? We all do our part. God, I'm going to ask Ed to come back up. But the whole body, held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. The ligaments hold things together in the body. And that's the, the, the commitments that we make to, to serve alongside each other, to to care about each other, to believe the best about each other when we're not quite sure what's going on. So the last thing we want to just kind of touch about here is what are your conclusions about your place and responsibility? You know, how do you measure up to God's standards? And what might God be asking of you? How can you grow? If you're not involved in a team, and, and you can be, I realize there are people who cannot be, what team could you be involved in? Come tonight and you'll get an overview of them, <laughs> six o'clock. <laughs> but how can you plug in? See, those are questions that you need to be asking the Lord. And obviously in a group like this, because we have so many people who do volunteer, 
Men, most people are plugged in. And I know that some people are plugged in with your prayers, and you, can, you, know, you don't live near here. It's hard to get near here. You, know, you don't have transportation readily. And, and people are praying at home, and that's a team that we haven't even really thought about or talked about. But, you know, I look at that challenge of what purpose am I serving that is bigger than my own life? And how can I do it better? Learning, growing, imperfect people. Learning to get along, learning to forgive, learning to to keep the main thing the main thing. Learning to keep Christ first. This is Pastor Dan Kramer from Zion Christian Church. I want to thank you for watching this video of our worship service. God is on the move, and we are so thankful. I'd love to invite you to join us Sunday mornings at 10 o'clock here at Zion Christian Church. I know that you would be encouraged by our worship and the ministry of God's Word. It's a wonderful group of people to be connected to. Why not join us this Sunday at Zion Christian Church? God bless you.